Uh, Dr. Scott Russo, thanks for appearing on Brainwaves today. Thanks, Brandon. It's great to be here. Well, good, good, good. Um, so you are a assistant professor of neuroscience at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and you have won the Imro Johnson & Johnson Rising Star Translational Research Award for your proposal to uh, investigate the connection between the elevated levels of an anti-inflammatory -infl protein in the brain called interleukin-6 and uh, potential ways to diagnose major depressive disorder and also potential new therapies for major depressive disorder coming out of that, that research. Yeah. Uh, it, it sounds, as we'll, I hope, see in this interview, pretty like there's a lot, there's a lot to that, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more. Um, so what prompted you, well, first let me start with the question, you know, how did you first get interested in this field, in, in neuroscience, and, and how it applies to depression? You know, I, I, I got interested in neuroscience back as an undergraduate. I was working in a drug abuse lab at the University of Buffalo, and, um, and it was really there that I became interested in, in motivated behavior. Drug abuse is, is a well-established uh, uh, disease of motivated behavior, essentially. Um, and so I, I went on, I did a PhD, and throughout my training, it really became clear that um, there's a lot of disorders that are disorders of motivated behavior, particularly disorders things uh, disorders such as major depression and uh, and bipolar. Okay, um, so uh, well, it's uh, given your focus on major depression, it's you know it makes sense that um, uh, you you'd start looking at things like um, well, actually, it doesn't. I'm not sure how it makes sense yet because you haven't explained it yet. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the um, Connection between inflammation and depression, and mm -hmm. what, how, what made you start thinking about looking at that connection? Have you seen evidence for that? I wish I could take credit for uh, that idea myself. It's been a it's been a, a, an idea and a theme in the field of mental health for for decades now, and essentially it came out of uh, just people noticing that when they're sick, they're uh, experiencing symptoms that are very similar to those experienced in depression. So you, you generally uh, feel tired, you are uh, sad, you're, you're melancholic. And so people started to think that maybe there's something, some kind of connection between the uh, inflammatory immune response, which is elevated when you're sick, and depression uh, as a disorder. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think that connection might be? And like, how would that work in the brain? We've started to try to make that connection experimentally. So the, f the first thing we did was to, to just assess pro-inflammatory cytokines in humans that experience depression. But, but we started by looking in the periphery. It's one of the major sources of these pro-inflammatory cytokines are coming from your immune cells and, and peripheral uh, blood systems. And we found elevations in patients that had chronic relapsing major depression. Um, and so we what we did was we then developed a mouse model of this disorder and uh, started to identify changes within uh, central nervous system within brain structures and what we're finding it's re really interesting is that the interleukin 6 that's elevated in the blood seems to be highly elevated in structures that control normal reward processing so these would be brain structures that are active when you eat a piece of chocolate or if you have a glass of wine these are the same brain structures that become dysfunctional in drug addicts and so it it, it really does suggest that interleukin-6 is acting in those brain centers that signal normal positive pleasure in a human being so maybe if there's too much of it it would decrease the pleasure somebody could experience uh, uh, on a normal basis exactly that's the idea okay wow okay um, so, going to uh, your proposal to look at this as a biomarker, um, you, you might expect to find somebody with elevated levels of interleukin-6, they might have major depressive disorder or be susceptible to it. Um, but what proportion of people do you think roughly could be diagnosed this way with a blood test for interleukin-6 ele elevated after stress? So right now, if you look at the, the, the population of people that have major depressive disorder, 
and you uh, classify them based upon their response to antidepressants, or at least their response to currently available antidepressants. You have about 30% of the population that responds well to currently available antidepressants. You've got 30% or so that uh, respond, but they don't respond very well, and oftentimes you have to uh, supplement medications and um, supplement other forms of therapy. And then you've got 30% of the population approximately, give or take, that just doesn't respond at all. And, um, and are typically given electroconvulsive shock therapy. So I think that in our population, we're finding elevated levels in that upper 30% that's treatment resistant, mm -hmm. completely treatment resistant. But I wouldn't be surprised if there was, there was a, a mixed level of elevation in that middle 30% where you're seeing some responsiveness, but you're also seeing um, you know, uh, the, the need to really uh, facilitate their treatment with other medications. Okay. So that this could this new potential treatment could help a lot of people potentially uh, up to I think there's yeah definitely there's a lot of people within that and I think for for us as as scientists and I think for clinicians the uh, the priority population is that thirty percent that's treatment resistant because they don't have anything in their toolbox right now to help treat those patients and they're the most at risk. Okay, that's great that you're developing this. Um, so um, you know. Uh, you're looking at um, d uh, new possible ways to treat uh, depression using this this connection um, between inflammation and depression. So, are there any drugs that are in use today that are anti-inflammatory in nature that could potentially be adapted for use in major major depressive disorder? There's a lot of over-the-counter medications. You know, there's obvious problems with over-the-counter medications like uh, you know ibuprofen. Chronic, chronic administration of ibuprofen can give you ulcers. It's probably not something you want to take every day for the rest of your life. There's some new drugs that target um, interleukin-6 in particularly uh, that were, was just FDA approved recently for the treatment of psoriasis and other related inflammatory diseases. So there's definitely some prescription uh, anti-inflammatories that are at least successful in treating other diseases that could be adapted. There is some over-the-counter meds, but obviously the, the, the caveats with those uh, do exist. So um, I think right now we're in a phase where we can say that uh, we've, we've developed enough information from a, from a basic science perspective to, to go forward with this and test if it's effective in human populations. But we do need the appropriate clinical trials and we do need the appropriate safety tests to really determine that. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, so it would, it would take a, a few years, five potentially five or even, maybe even more years, to develop a, a, and approve a new medication for use in humans, and uh, uh, thus I'd probably counsel patients to people waiting for that. But mm -hmm. if, but for people who are waiting, what would you counsel them to do to improve their inflammatory response right now, who, who have depression? And what would you what would you say to them? You know, my training is in psychology, so I always say that the first line of defense is, is things that you can change uh, just in your behavior. Those are, the, those are the easiest and oftentimes the most robust regulators of your mood uh, in general. And so two of, two of the most profound, and I hate to sound like a broken record because people probably hear about this in the media all the time, but the two most profound anti-inflammatory uh, uh, things that you can do in your life are to exercise daily and to change your diet, to eat things that are much healthier that you may not want to, low fat, you know, low, low uh, processed carb kinds of things. Those are, those are uh, robustly anti-inflammatory and are already established to affect mood. So I would start with that first and, um, and as we develop these things further, I think there may be a new line of medications designed on those theories. That's amazing, and I can certainly vouch for the efficacy of what you've just described. Exercise and diet it helps me a lot too. Me like, too. It's like night and day. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, uh, last question: um, Do you think there might be connections? It kind of seems like there might be between elevated interleukin six and, and a, a variety of mental disorders, and not just depression. Absolutely, this is one of the the most attractive things about interleukin six is both a biomarker and a drug target. Elevations in interleukin-6, which are found um, across the board in mental disorders, we've we've identified it in major. We've identified it in major depression, as have other groups. Um, others have identified it elevated in bipolar disorder, 
in post-traumatic stress disorder and also recently in schizophrenia. So it does seem to be a, a very robust regulator of, of the way in which you feel and how that's expressed in your behavior. That's amazing. Wow. And, and uh, so, so you're kind of you're on the forefront of, of developing new ways to look at um, uh, mental disorders and and uh, and treat them based on this new kind of area of research. So that's that must feel pretty exciting. It's extremely exciting, and you know, starting out and and, and working uh, in basic sciences, you don't usually get to see your discoveries make it into uh, uh, people's lives. And so I think that with this particular strategy, I may be able to see it affect people's lives before I retire. That's so cool. we'll, we'll see. All right, that's really cool. Well, thanks for doing the excellent work that you're doing. Um, and uh, thanks for appearing on Brainwaves again. Thanks, Brandon, it was a pleasure. All right. All right. Thanks again for appearing on Brainwaves. Uh, and uh, so people may have some questions for you online. Uh, you are ready to answer some questions? Sure, sure. Great. Well, thanks again. Yep. Have a good one, Brennan. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.